as I've said from the beginning, ours was not a campaign, but rather an incredible and great movement made up of millions of hardworking men and women who love their country and want a better, brighter future for themselves and for their family. This is painful, and it will be for a long time. But I want you to remember this. Our campaign was never about one person or even one election. It was about the country we love and about building an America that's hopeful, inclusive, and big-hearted. Working together, we will begin the urgent task of rebuilding our nation and renewing the American dream. It has been quite a week for politics. I'm Andrew Hill, and welcome to Politics Unplugged. And I'm Marshall Zellinger. If I said it once, I said it a dozen times. Polls are crap. It wasn't decided until late <laughs> in the night, but Donald Trump is now your president-elect. And less than 36 hours after winning that race, Donald Trump made a trip to the White House to meet with President Obama. The two met in the Oval Office for an hour and a half. Then they let the cameras in and talked a little about their meeting. We now are going to... Uh want to do everything we can to help you succeed. I very much look forward to dealing with the president in the future, including counsel. Uh, he's uh, he explained some of the difficulties, some of the, the high-flying assets, and some of, the, some of the really great things that have been achieved. I think there were a few cameras in the room. The meeting was expected to only last about 10 minutes, but Trump said 90 minutes was not long enough and it could have gone on longer. And joining us today to talk about something that happened last week, <laughs> conservative talk show host Krista Kafer, host of Kelly and Kafer on KNUS Radio, and Democratic strategist Ted Trimpa, principal and CEO of Trimpa Group. And we're glad to have both of you here. Krista, we want to start with you because I know you were not a, a Trump fan, but... Did you end up voting for Trump like so many others finally did? No, I didn't vote for him. Um, like a lot of never Trumpers, we were never to the end. Um, that said, I, I want to put the year behind us and give him the benefit of the doubt, see if he can be a better man. I, 120 million, a little more, like a little less than that, voted in this election, mm -hmm. half and half. And I guess if we could interview all of them right now, I have a feeling we'd have 10 million not tell us they actually voted for Trump still. So. Where are all the, will we ever know who actually voted for Trump's? Well, it's, they call it a secret ballot for a reason, right? right. But uh, yeah, I think there were people who, did, who voted for him that didn't tell other people, and that's of course their choice. But I, I think if you're embarrassed to, to, to admit something, you probably shouldn't have done it. Yeah, I think there's also a, a point that the undervote for Hillary was greater than what we thought. When you compare how Democrats turned out for Obama for how Democrats turned out for Hillary, there are significant differences. So I'm not for sure it's as much the silent majority or the silent vote as it was Democrats just didn't turn out in numbers that they should have. And Trump actually outperformed Romney in all of those states that were a surprise. Well, we heard Marshall say polls are crap, and this was proof. So what, what happened? What did pollsters miss? I don't, you can't poll intensity. Mm -hmm. um, people are really, really upset. And if you think about how Trump got to where he was, he went against the establishment, he went against the money, he went against the elites, and he won. You know, Hillary had a process where, quite frankly, the DNC piece was rigged. There really wasn't a true competition. So a lot of those Democrats that were really upset in that same passionate way that Republicans were and are, really weren't allowed to have their voice heard. And I think that's a lot of the undervote. You're seeing video of Donald Trump coming out when he gave his uh, winning speech early in the morning that may be more remembered for his son, Baron Trump, almost falling <laughs> asleep. But in that speech, uh, after the election, Trump admitted it was a tough road, but he said he wants what is best. America will no longer settle for anything less than the best. We must reclaim our country's destiny and dream big and bold and daring. We have to do that. We're going to dream of things for our country and beautiful things and successful things once again. All right, so what, what's his first challenge? I mean, we've heard his list of his to-do list. Well, he's got some very impressive people from the Heritage Found Foundation and others helping him assemble a, cab a cabinet. That could be a good thing. I think what he needs to do is ally the fears of so many people out there, particularly on the left, because he said some very divisive things, you know, about mass deportations and other things. And of course, you get an amplification of that 
On either side, the left or the right, fear-mongering is big business, whether it's the Daily Cause or talk radio. But I think we have, uh, uh, he needs to, I think all of us need to reach out to everybody and make sure that they're not afraid to go on. I mean, it's, I feel sad for a lot of these folks in the protesters. The protesters. I think that, honestly, some of them are very fearful. I think others are possibly paid to be there, but there are other people who are genuinely fearful. He needs to speak to those people. And how can he do that in this administration? Well, first of all, it needs to come from him. You know, and you saw that little glitch with the tweet that he put out, you know, when the protest started, you know, and he said something about it, and like, very unfair, and then what was like an hour or two hours later, there was another, you know, a tweet about wanting to be united and we're going to be a great nation. He needs to do a lot of that latter. And as someone that comes from the left, I think we need to give him some time. Yeah. Trust him. Let's see if the calm, private Donald Trump that everybody talks about is actually the one that shows up. Because I think where the starkness is going to come, when they start rolling out the policy proposals that they're going to do, the executive orders that they're going to reverse, if people want something to get upset about, hold your fire because you're going to have plenty there. We so, need to give them a chance. I think everybody does. And I say this as an ardent never-Trumper. Let's give the man a chance. There He's was, president. There was a, an LA Times article citing somewhere else back in August of if you looked at the tweets from Donald Trump, if you saw the the kind ones it came from it said twitter for iphone and if they were the more <laughs> like rough start like the the one that's like this is unfair these protesters it came from i don't know if this one came from it but it came from an android so again like i didn't see which one came from which if, if oh, there was wow. that discrepancy for these two tweets but which donald trump do we get i mean is it the one who was campaigning or, or kelly on conway that, that we just <laughs> yeah, <saw? laughs> or do we see the one that gave that speech that seemed to be unifying I actually think it's going to be the unifying. I really do. I think he's going to have those moments, and I can't believe I'm saying this. I think he's going to have those moments where he slides a little bit. But, you know, you could tell that once Kellyanne Conway was there, once you could tell that the son-in-law, Jared, was around a lot, it, the, the tenor of the campaign really did change. He would slide off the rails every now and then. That's basically when they let him talk by himself. Um, but I, He's the president-elect. We need to treat him as the president-elect. It's the, it's the office, you know, for the leader of the free world and for us, yeah. and we need to treat it as such. What will he need to do to allay the fears, though, of the, the protesters who are out there? And we're talking major cities. I mean, is it with who he names in his administration? What are the, the initial steps to help calm what's happening in our country? I think he needs to communicate these things. I mean, he's famous for his, uh, his Twitter. He needs to do it on Twitter. He needs to do it in other outlets that he has at his disposal. He needs to rely on surrogates, people who are in talk radio, anyone who can say, you know, we need to have empathy. We need to have empathy for people who are scared. And I, I, I think it's kind of all on all of us to do that. For sure. So I want to, we don't want to forget about the losing side. Hillary Clinton did have her concession speech the next day. Uh, and she had this to say about is getting close as she did to almost winning. I know we have still not shattered that highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. now there's a lot of time and effort put to having her party inside the convention center in New York that had its own built-in glass ceiling that wow. was not, did not get to be used. Will have will we stepped backwards? Right. Yeah. When when would be the next opportunity? It will happen in our lifetime. Absolutely. It definitely will. I think she was a really flawed candidate. I think she ran a flawed campaign. She was under a lot of legal st uh, scrutiny. I think the uh, the failures of Obamacare and other things were, you know, sort of caught up to her as a candidate. That's it. I mean, she's obviously devastated right now. And so I think that I'm hoping that whether it's in private or whatever, that that Trump and others will show her kindness. She worked hard. And this is an end of a dream for her. Yeah, they miscalculated the passion that was on the ground and why people were upset. And we should have listened more to the Bernie supporters and why they were saying and doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And we as Democrats didn't do that. Is Colorado insulated by this? Because in our own square bubble, we were blue and things kind of developed Which I want to for know, Democrats. Yet once again, in, this, in the second red wave, you'd look at the map and there's one state, actually two, Nevada and here, that were blue. And I think that is one because we have done a significant amount of work over the years of building up our constituency groups, our issue groups, in terms of, the, of, of our side on the left. Um, and actually, I think we're better on the ground in terms of how we do um, electoral politics. Kristen, what do Republicans have to do to be the, red in Colorado? You know, I think there was a, a fracturing. Um, I was sad to see uh, Daryl Glenn not win. I think he was a good, he's a good guy. But that, did you, 
how close he was, given like he did not campaign toward the end. I mean, that was a close race for not going out. And Which is evidence that the red wave, the Trump wave, was happening here, too. I mean, it, it is, it's remarkable that we were able to gain ha ha a seats in the state house, mm -hmm. that we left the state senate where it was, and Bennett only won by, what, 3%. Well, it's we a 50-50 state. And we will talk about the State House here in just a couple of minutes. We thank you both for spending time with us to talk about this uh, wild year that we've had. All right, we'll be right back.